Hey, hey, welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files. I am so glad to welcome Vanessa Hung to the show. She is the founder and CEO, I think, of Online Seller Solutions, and she is really geeked about helping you with all of your Amazon problems, all the stuff that we don't love to deal with. She has an amazing organization and agency for that. But today, we are here to talk more about expanding into the Hispanic community so that we can um, bring more products to the table and tap into a demographic that maybe you guys are missing out on. So thank you, Vanessa. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Christine. Um, it's a pleasure. Uh, super excited to be here. I remember the first time I saw you presenting in a group. That was like long, long time ago. I still, at that moment, I didn't have my agency yet. Mm -hmm. I was like consulting, being an e-commerce manager. So it's been a long way. I'm, I'm very excited now. I make it to places like this. So it's, it's amazing. I'm so proud of you. I'm proud to see all of your progression and how you've been able to kind of go from just being an Amazon seller to then creating an agency and now serving and helping people in this crazy Amazon community that we um, are serving in today. So tell us a little bit about how you got started with Amazon and how you moved into the agency. Perfect. So I started as an e-commerce manager for our company where I was managing three different accounts. All of them were, um, like uh, brand names, right? We were reselling because this company was an authorized distributor uh, in South Florida for all of these big brands. So we were selling on Amazon and, and that went amazing. That's where I learned the every single detail of Seller Central, how to manage a catalog that was like more than 100,000 SKUs because we were selling like uh, clothing and accessories. So, you know, there's a lot of variations there. So that's where I found my kind of passion I I didn't know when I started I didn't know where where that was gonna uh, take me and it ended up taking me into flat files and all the back end stuff and everything in Seller Central to make uh, like proper account management which I fall in love with it, I think it's one of the most overlooked or underrated kind of areas and in the whole ecosystem everybody loves ppc or everybody loves branding or you know creating cool products but not a lot of people focus on the management of the account mm -hmm. so i i happen to be you know very good at it and also i really like it so it kind of you know when you find the thing that you're good at that also match your passion and also they pay you for well basically i was there and eventually start consulting on the side. And that's where I um, started going to groups and communities where I saw you speaking. And, you know, I, I became in contact with a lot of people in the space. And I realized, uh, looking at all of the figures that were educating people, it was like there, there was a hole mm -hmm. in this situation of backend management, in the things that I knew a lot about and the things that I was good at. So I went to um, communities like the Wizards of Ecom in, in South Florida. And there the people had questions that I'm like, this is so easy. Like, I don't understand why people ask about flat files. Like, don't you ever, like, doesn't everybody use these flat files? I don't, I don't understand, right? So, so then I realized, like, no, actually, no. That that's like kind of like that's an enchanted forest that nobody likes to go in because everybody's like super afraid of what might happen. And yeah, that's where I realized that there is a big space. I started consulting, freelancing for some people, then creating content. And, and I started creating content before having the agency. And when I started creating content, people like went crazy, like, oh, my God, how is that you do this? Can you help me here? Can you help me there? So I started hiring people. And eventually, you know, that became a like a company it's funny because mm -hmm. one starts like a consultant and then it's like I have 13 employees and you know I have a huge operations and we have a lot of clients um and yeah in the meantime it, like in those years because it's been five years now I've been also like I was a seller too and I did every single model I did arbitrage I did wholesale private label I had one private label that was a super big failure and one that was really good but I didn't keep doing it because the agency grew 
and I, I like agency problems. Mm -hmm. I don't like really like having seller problems. Even though I help, I help sellers solving them in Seller Central, I like those problems, mm -hmm. but not the other things like, I don't know, inventory or suppliers or, you know. I love, I love that you're saying a lot of these things is because uh, there's so many people in entrepreneurship that feel like they have to be good at all of the things they have to, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you're supposed to be good at finance and marketing and creativity and content and all these things. And it's simply not true. And that's what I loved how you stepped into your own lane and stayed in your own lane based on your skills and what you like. I always use this as a great example. My sister is very opposite of me. She loves anything behind the scenes, things with spreadsheets, things with numbers, things that are very logical and concrete and just exact. And that's a personality that she has. So she loves, like you said, things that you're passionate about and that you love is oftentimes what other people uh, cause them the most stress and the most problems. For example, me and flat files do not get along. So that's why I love that there's the Vanessa's in the world that love to take on the things that the, that some other people just don't like to do. I'm very creative. I'm very, it's like ambitious and ambiguous. And I like to have lots of colors and shapes and styles. And when it comes to like numbers and for spreadsheets and flat files. I'm like, oh no. So I am so personally thankful that there are others like you and your agency who enjoy solving some of the problems that the rest of us pull our hair out about. So thank you in advance for all of that. And I love how you built that just from realizing what you're good at and what you really thrive and what you like doing. Um, because anybody can make money, right? Anybody can start a business, make money, you know, just kind of sell product or, or figure out a system. But you really not only have done that to shape how you pay yourself, but also what you enjoy doing along with your skill set. And I really admire that. Yeah, it wasn't, it, I'm going to tell you, it wasn't easy. That part was, it took me like two years to really come back and, and regain my trust in myself. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, like, like that confidence, like, oh, re I'm actually really good at this. Because when I launched my first brand, that was terrible. It was terrible, Christine, like, we lost a lot of money. It, it did perform horribly on Amazon. And that's because I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to say it's because, um, oh, the, the other factors outside of me, but the things that I knew, about Amazon and the things of uh, account management and all of this stuff, they were flawless. But then other stuff like um, suppliers and inventory, and actually we were importing that inventory from another country, not China, but uh, the regulations from that product and things that we didn't know. So I feel that sometimes people get into this thinking that it's like, oh, super easy, super quick. And, and actually me being like after a year and a half of doing Amazon, I still had a brand that was a failure. Mm -hmm. So with that, I had to sit back and say like, okay, what was the thing that failed? And I'm like, okay, well, packaging wasn't the best thing. Then supply chain wasn't the best thing, but that was in my expertise, right? So I could either learn, right? And and did it and do it again, which I did. And, and the second time was way better. Or I can just like sit and like be frustrated forever and, and think that the, the, the system doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a huge, there is a huge learning curve. And right now, and I think the gap is getting bigger and bigger and bigger of all of the areas that we need to be exceptional at mm. to be successful. Like Amazon, I when I started, that was in 2017. Uh, that was a different monster. Like mm -hmm. we, the, the rules were different. The areas were different. Things were more easy. The market wasn't as saturated as it is right now. So if you lack experience in supply chain, you could still make it. Like you could still launch a product as I did, right? Um, not super successful, but right now, it's not even in the question that you are not an expert or you you don't know your things. So for everybody listening, it's it takes time and you need to really come to um, you know peace with the things that you don't know how to do and look for help elsewhere, right? Having a partner, having a consultant, because you don't you I don't think any entrepreneur or any Amazon business owner can do 
everything mm. excellent right absolutely and it's so true like the the jack of all trades master of none is not advantageous for anyone we need to have expertise you wouldn't like i always kind of liken this to like the medical community you wouldn't you wouldn't go to a doctor to fix a legal issue you go to a lawyer you go to a specialist you go to somebody who knows exactly what they're doing in a specific niche or style you wouldn't go to even your eye doctor to get your teeth fixed that's why we have specialties same thing applies to business. When we're in business, specifically with dealing with Amazon, we have PPC experts, we have coaches and consultants, we have people that do back end work, uh, like you guys do with flat files and your account management. But then there's also inventory and shipping experts, there's prep centers who can, you know, filter your information and filter your products and put them, you know, other places. So getting an expert in everything, I feel like is really, really important. If you want to grow, if you want to scale and you want to have a successful business, you have have to remember that it takes time and energy to build. You can't continue doing the same things over and over and expect, expect growth. You must scale in a different way. And that partially is investing in some experts, even if it's just for a few minutes, a few a specific project that you need. Um, but reality is, is that once you get into it, it's not quick, it's not easy. And I love that you said that this is a real legitimate business. And any legitimate business um, takes time to grow, it takes time to learn and experience that and that's why you know people like you and i are providing content for people and training so that they can really understand that yes there's a learning curve but also there can be major successes at the end of that learning curve if you just stay with it and figure out what what are your strengths you 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 lean into your strengths and you utilize what you what's easy for you if something comes easy for you like vanessa you were saying how it's easy for you to do a lot of these the the back end work that no one likes doing and if it's like easy for you that's what you really should be doing most of and then hiring out your weaknesses if there's something if you're not very creative and you don't like to you know do product research then that's something that you can hire out to someone else and you can do the rest so i love your advice on that now let's shift a little bit into um you, we talked off camera a little bit about the hispanic community and how that's growing on amazon and growing not just in uh, amazon mexico but also the u.s market for the hispanic community so let's go into that because I believe all my audience members have, we all have room to grow, right? And this is a, a wide open space where we can grow in this area. So let's talk about that. Perfect. Actually, it's my favorite topic to talk about. And I don't know if you noticed so far, uh, I have an accent because I'm from Venezuela. I grew up there, so I'm Hispanic. And one of the things that I realized in last year was that Amazon provides a, an experience both in the website and in the app, completely in Spanish, meaning that every single area of the page is in Spanish, the listings are in Spanish, everything that you can see is in Spanish. The only thing that doesn't translate is the reviews. Reviews are not translated because they remain in the, in the uh, native or in the language that was written. So they don't translate that, but everything else gets translated. So. It was super curious because the story was last year uh, on Christmas. It was not the Christmas of 2021. My mom came to visit and she was buying stuff on Amazon. And, and when she was showing me the listings, it's like, hey, this is what I want to buy. I'm like, what is this? Like, what is that you're buying? I don't understand. Like, it was something super simple, like nail clippers, right? And she was looking into a listing that was horrible, but it was horrible because it was translated into Spanish. So the title was like five words and it didn't have bullet points. And the pictures were like all, cr all crazy, no A plus content. And I'm like, I, I don't understand what is that you're looking for. And I realized then that she was using the app in Spanish right? Because my mom speaks Spanish. So she needs that because she cannot navigate through the amazon.com in English. Mm -hmm. And then that was like, oh, this is interesting. And I became, uh, I started researching about it. And I realized that the algorithm for the results in Spanish is different from the algorithm that we have in English. So for example, you are selling a uh, a plant, right? You're selling roses. And if you put in English, bouquet of roses, you're gonna be in the number one 
uh, in their organic position, right? But if you look for this, the same keyword or, or a keyword that is a synonym of that in Spanish, or a, a similar translation, you could be in page number seven, you know, position 100 mm -hmm. instead of number one. Why? Because they have a completely different uh, algorithm that rearranges results based on your input of those keywords in Spanish. So that to me, that was the first thing that was mind blowing. I'm like, what is going on? Because what, what I'm talking about is you, you are. If you're selling on Amazon, you are already selling to the Hispanic user. This is not a thing. I'm what I'm talking about is not like, oh, create a new SKU, make a new offer. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. You are already doing it because Amazon is translating that information for you. And the caveat here is that they don't do it proactively. Hmm. So it's not like, for example, you improve your SEO, you improve, you improve your title with new, new keywords or new bullet points. Amazon is not going proactively to translate that for you. They, they have like a legacy translation in the back end and they will use the things that they had in the back. So that was the first thing that I'm like, oh, wow, this is impressive because we and I think a lot of people are missing out. And then the second part was when I started researching into the demographics of the Hispanic market, the Hispanic demographic in the U.S. is the fastest growing mm -hmm. in, the, in, in the States, right? Uh, the amount of, of people are in, in the state right now, the ones that are accounted by the, by the federal census was yeah. 70 million. Mm. And that was in 2020. I believe so yeah. so 2023 we're in 2023 that probably is way higher that was one thing and then another part of the demographic another insight that I that that was super interesting is that 75 percent of them are millennials or younger so they're native shoppers they they grew up with the internet they are accustomed to buy online so they are already your clients probably on Amazon. But the problem is, and, and this is and this is true now, now putting my hat as a Hispanic uh, person, this demographic is extremely underserved. And what I mean by underserved is they don't have, so for example, you create a Shopify uh, website. I'll say 99% of the people don't care about uh, translating that website into other languages. Mm -hmm. Even though there are 70 million people in the United States that speak Spanish and would like to see the content, I would like to, you know. So most things online that are around shopping are like Google translated, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, when you go to a listing on Amazon and you see like a, a weird uh title that you you because you're a native english speaker you can't know i like in three seconds you know if that was written by somebody that was non-native yeah you know so imagine having that everywhere all the time mm. right so so that part makes it really difficult for that community to engage with your brand to you know to be loyal to understand what you're selling so most things are like okay who is from all of the things that i'm having here who's the one that make does it better so right now amazon provides you the platform to have that communication to to improve your listings for the spanish experience and to sell to them the other thing that i know thanks to to my connections and the people i know on amazon, at, at amazon uh, they told me that there is there are 39 million prime members that use the the experience both the website and the app in the phone in spanish so from those 70 million that are in the states 39 are already uh, shopping on that's Amazon. that's more than half guys just do the math there that's more than half that's 40 we'll just round it to 40 i like the nice round numbers right round it to 40 million u.s-based spanish-speaking folks 
out there ready to buy your products. This is mind blowing. This is a niche within a niche. So Amazon's already a niche. Like it, it, as much as it's huge and it's global and you know, pretty much everybody has Amazon, it's still a niche within a niche. So inside of this Amazon Prime box that we all sell in, um, we're now adding that our Hispanic and Spanish speaking um, US customer base still there so what are some of the steps that we can do because you already mentioned like so you guys just to, to clarify we don't need to be having a new listing and a brand new listing that's all written in spanish there are ways to get to amazon's back end that will translate this on our behalf so let's talk about some of the steps because here's the reality there are plenty of non-english speaking um citizens that want to buy your products they just can't always read it or they can't find it because they're looking for spanish words is this right is this how you know the the spanish speaking community is typing in yeah. their spanish words because they might not know the english word for what they're looking for even i know my brother-in-law is um native to puerto rico native uh spanish speaker and he came here when he was 18. And so although he learned some English in school, my sister, who was his girlfriend and now his wife, um, kind of taught him all the different English. So um, we're used to, we call it Spanglish around here, and uh, we're used to um, um, talking with him and and he he still even after 20 something years of being um in the u.s speaking english he still struggles to find the right words sometimes for things and he you know coming up so this is kind of this is who we're serving and how do we serve them better what are some things that we can do to incorporate um spanish or and or spanish and translating into the amazon space so we can serve more uh, of the population i love i love the question there are two parts of it of it. The first thing is what we can do. And the other thing is what you mentioned, which I love is that Amazon is a niche and this is a niche within a niche. Mm -hmm. And I'll go, I will go deeper. In the, in the Hispanic community, there are niches for every single mm -hmm. culture or, or nationality because we speak a different Spanish in Venezuela than the one in Argentina or the one in Mexico or the one in Spain. There are different. So the, the, let's say that you're selling a spatula. The name for that in, in Venezuelan Spanish is probably different from the one in, in Spain. So the amazing thing here, because we're talking about the same product, but we're, we're talking about different path, different search terms to get to that product. So there that that's the layer and that's probably the the place where um native english speakers will find the most amount of complexity is finding those keywords for every single like country right and then we have the the other part of what we can do on amazon so i'm gonna walk you through the things that you need to do right now to notice if you can uh, or if you are selling properly to them. So first thing, and, and this is something that I see all the time, is that there are discrepancies within between the information in English and the information in Spanish. So if your listing in English is an object, the Spanish translation is the shadow we need to have the exact same. We, it needs to be a shadow. Sometimes that's separated because the information in Spanish is different. So you will go to your, to your amazon.com, you go on Amazon and you will look for your listing. And on the top uh, bar that we have where the search bar is, next to the search bar, there is a, an American flag. If you click on the American flag, you will see two options, English and Spanish. So you will click Spanish and click continue and the whole experience in your amazon.com will change to spanish and don't worry you can reverse that back but that's that's where you notice what are the discrepancies in my listings so for example if you're if and i see this so often if, if your title is let's say 150 characters you will see maybe that when you change it to spanish it's only 30 characters so there's not a lot of information or you have five bullet points with, I don't know, three rows of information. And in Spanish, it's just three bullet points and it's just one line. Mm -hmm. So that visually, without you knowing Spanish, that visually tells you that there is a discrepancy. Mm -hmm. 
So that's the first thing that you need to do. You need to find those discrepancies if you have. The, the way it works is that Amazon automatically translate your listing when you create it. Well, so, so when you create the ASIN, and this is a, a very frequent practice on, in, in, the, in the industry is that I'm going to create the ASIN and I'm going to leave it there because I need the FSQ to send it to my, my manufacturer or make the, the packaging or whatever. And, and then like three weeks after is that I'm going to optimize that listing. I'm going to put the right title, the Bible books, right. Mm -hmm. But when the creation happens, with that information that you created the listing is that Amazon is going to translate it automatically. And, and three weeks after, one month after, when you really put your real keywords or your real SEO and all the stuff, Amazon won't go again and, and translate that. So what you need to do is to request the update. And, and there is a thing here. I'm not telling you to go and translate your listing in Spanish. Unfortunately, in the US, you cannot give them the copy in Spanish that you want. Unfortunately, you could do that in Mexico, but this is different. And the listings, and this is a question that I get quite often, it's like, oh, if I but if I sell in Mexico, they're taking the information that, that they have in Mexico to put it in my Spanish listing in the US? No. Mm -hmm. the, the, the answer is no. They use the translation of the information that is in English. So you need to if you see discrepancies, and I've seen listings where that the whole bullet points disappear or there is no description or, you know, the title is just, um, you know, 20 characters. In that case, you need to open the case with seller support and you need to request the update in the translation. So when you, you're going to take the ASIN, you're going to take a screenshot a screenshot in English and a screenshot in Spanish. And potentially, if you see a lot of discrepancies, you can highlight that without knowing Spanish, mm -hmm. right? You, you can notice when the title is shorter. You can notice if bullet points are missing. Like you can notice those things. And if the representative that helps you in seller, seller support, if, even if they don't speak Spanish, they could also notice that. And it is, it is an automatic tool for them. They need to escalate that to a specific team and they just need to update the translation, right? It's just clicking a button and, you know, uh, updating that. That's one part. And that's the thing that you should have regardless. If like with the things that I'm going to start talking about are more stra strategic things that you could do to laser target that audience. If you don't want to do that because you think that's too much work, that's totally fine. But at least make sure that your listing with the copy is selling your product correctly in Spanish. Because one big thing is that the images don't get translated. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously we cannot translate an image. So, so the uh, Hispanic consumer only relies on the information that is in the copy, in the title, in the technical details, in the bullet points. So, so if they don't know how to read English and you have nice information in your images that's going to get lost so mm -hmm. at least improve your shopping experience in the spanish part like that but let's say you already did it or that your listings are perfect if you if you think if you don't see any um, visible discrepancy you could ask somebody that knows spanish to tell you like hey this makes sense because if it doesn't make sense you could also request uh, an update on the translation and they're using a very sophisticated um neural translation machine like like it is it is a translation machine that is way better than one that what we have like in google translate you know mm -hmm. that when google translate is not the best thing they have something more sophisticated. So they, they create context and they create, you know, uh, the vernacular for each specific, you know, uh, keyword. So, so yeah, so it is, it is way better. Um, it is not perfect. It's, I, I'll say like, I still kind of notice when something is not written by a person, but it's a hundred percent better than, than other options, to mm -hmm. be honest. So if you already have that, then the other thing is like, how can I target that audience? So one thing that you're going to do is using the back end of your listing. And when I mean back end could be either flat files, which is, which is the thing that I love, or when you go to your um, vital info in your listing, 
you could there in the space that you have available there, the retail space that you have to input keywords, you're going to put Spanish keywords. And this is not new. I don't believe this is a new uh, strategy, but a lot of people talk about this since way back, like a long time ago. But the thing is that uh, it was funny because they were talking about inputting Spanish keywords, but their listing in the in the front end was terrible. Mm. So they will never convert if the if the experience is not optimized for those users. You understand? Like, yeah. if, even if you show up in the results, I'll be like, this doesn't make sense, or this, you know, this listing looks shady or you know that that you don't um you don't show like a good experience so that's the other part and i know that our retail space in the back end is something super sacred for example generic keywords you only have 250 characters which is you know very little for all of the things that you would like to say and all of the keywords that you would like to rank but if you are let's say selling a product where let's say spatula where you have the, the keyword spatula in the title in the bullet points in the detail pay in the sorry technical details in the description in the a plus content also in the images and you're ranking for that keyword really well i will say like take that out of your generic keywords and put the same um keyword but in spanish Right. So it's like kind of a, a paid off. We need to we need to compromise some some keywords in English to have space for the Spanish. I do not recommend that you remove all of your English keywords and pull everything in Spanish. That's not what I'm saying. But if there is something that you can sacrifice, I'll do that because those keywords in the back end will help you rank. And that's the next step that we want to do. Right. We want to rank for that translation or, or that query that the customer is using uh, like to, to, to get to that product. So it is important. And the last thing that I'll say, Chris, in the last step is when you do that and when you're ranking for your keywords in Spanish, now is the time to expand to other sub niches. So, so we're working now in a project uh, for a big seller it's kind of the number one seller in their subcategory. And the product that they're selling is a backpack. And backpack has, I cannot tell you how many different words in Spanish can mean backpack. And each of one, one of them are related to a different country. Mo most of the time, so, so the, the way they call it in Mexico, the way they call it in Colombia, the way they call it in Argentina. So that's opening more sub niches and more sub niches and keep, digging like deeper and deeper and deeper the and and the other thing is when you when you say that you will say like oh well that's very complex for somebody that doesn't speak spanish i i understand that and my advice here is going to the marketplace in spanish to see how is that your customers are shopping for your product so this is a trip uh, it's, it's, this is a tip um amazon has a counterpart in the Latin American and Hispanic world called Mercado Libre. Okay, Mercado Libre is like the Amazon of Latin America. And you could each each country has its own platform and that's where people shop online in Mercado Libre. So what you will do is obviously translate or get the translation out of Amazon of, of how is that your product is called and then go into Mercado Libre and look for that product with that translation into search results. In that way, you will see all of the listings that are your same product mm -hmm. and the way they call it. So if you see uh, trends, if you see, oh, they're using this keyword in this listing and in this listing and this list, this list, this listing is where you're like, oh, okay, this is the keyword that I should be using. Mm. So that's the research that I recommend when people have absolutely no clue about, um, you know, a, a, a Spanish, like they don't speak Spanish. Mm. The other thing that, that you could do is when you go to any of the tools that you use for keyword research, mm -hmm. call it Jungle Scout, Managed by Sad Seller Tools, Helium 10, whatever you use, mm -hmm. you're going to get a huge list of keywords for your specific listings or for your competitors. When you download that list, if you put that list in Google Sheets and you use the formula 
So you, you're going to have the column A with all of your search results. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's all of the keywords that people use. In the column next to that, you're going to put a formula that is, it, it, this is the way you rewrite it. Equal, the sign equal, then detect language. So two words all together. Equal, detect language, and then a parenthesis, and you're going to select column A, right? All column A, close parenthesis. That, what that will do is that the, the system will tell you in what language is that keyword uh, written. So when you drag that down to all of your keywords, you're going to find keywords in English, in Spanish, in French, in Korean, like I've seen everything, almost every language. And the next step is to filter the Spanish ones. So you're going to filter that column, the column B. You're going to filter it to Spanish to only show you the Spanish results. And that's how you get um, the Spanish keywords for, for Amazon.com. That's, a, that's a, like a huge thing, .com. Because mm -hmm. if you research keywords in Mexico or in, in Spain, you're going to get different results because what I told you about the, the different niches and the way that people call it. Um, so that's, those are the tips of how can you get those keywords. And then what you do, what, what is that you do with those keywords? Put it in the back end. Mm. In the search terms uh, or generic keywords or however it's called, it always changes. Um, anything that you could, you could see that is valuable to put, you're going to put it there. Don't waste time trying to put that in your title in the English version because that'll get translated regardless. So that's not as important and kind of like a tricky move there. So you just like keep it uh, in the back end. So to to summarize and clarify all of that, you're using whether you're using like Helium 10 or, or Merchant Words or any of that stuff and you download your major keywords, sorting them, filtering them. Also, we, we teach this in English as well. We teach people to like it, depending on what part of the country you're from, it, you use different words for different things. And so it's the same thing in the Spanish language, whether you're from, you know, like you said, Venezuela or Mexico or Spain or even Puerto Rico, they all have different language, like different types of Spanish. So what something is called in your region of the world might be called something different. So it's really advantageous to use all of those keywords. Um, do you, how many keywords do you feel like is relevant for the same word? So for example, spatula, you were, you were talking about that. How many different translations should you be putting in your keyword to kind of hit most of the demographic? Well, that's a that's a tricky one because I'll say that for search relevance, I'll stick to what any of your uh, tools give you in in the sense of like what is that they're looking the most because I believe uh, within the Hispanic market, the Mexican demographic is bigger than any of others. Mm -hmm. Right. So there are more Mexicans than any of the other nationalities within the Hispanic market. So probably using um, Mexican keywords are the mm -hmm. best outcome. Like you will get most the most amount of sales because they are the biggest the part of the demographic. Mm -hmm. um, but but that will um, create like a need for you to research that a little bit more mm -hmm. right to see if like okay maybe this is and, and that's the other cool part of the different niches and different nationalities is that potentially obviously a spatula well I, I think that could also apply but in different countries things are used for different stuff so an example that is super clear for example a griddle right you use a griddle probably to make pancakes right and to make breakfast and, and bacon and stuff like that that's in the in the american market and you, probably all of your pictures if you're selling a griddle is, is that like oh you can do pancakes and they want steak or crabs or whatever for the for the hispanic market in the in the mexican community the griddle is used to to make tortillas 
Mm. Okay. But in the in the Venezuelan market that's used to make arepas, which is a completely different food. So and and the way you call that in the different demographics is completely different, Christine. Mm -hmm. Like in Mexico it's called a grill is called comal. In Venezuela, that's called budare. It's mm. a way completely different yes. word. So so that's where you're gonna you kind of want to research that into the in the, into the data and see which one is the one that has the most amount of search volume and you go with that one because for example Argentina might call it something different but Argentina is not a demographic or it's not a culture that uses a griddle to cook a lot hmm. right so they probably don't use it as much as the Mexican ones. So you wouldn't want to put the way they call it there because nobody's looking for that, mm -hmm. right? Or, or something different. I mean, it could. that's why I like to go to Mercado Libre because, for example, if you go to Mercado Libre Argentina and you put your keyword and you don't find, and you don't find the results of your, of your product, <laughs> some people may think, oh, oh my God, this is an amazing opportunity. I'm going <laughs> to expand there. But but the other on the other side of the coin is like, maybe it's because nobody wants that. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's that nobody uses that, right? Mm -hmm. So so we need to understand that part. That's why I wanted to double double check with Mercado Libre if that's something that people are really looking for. And if you go again, to the griddle example, if you go to Mexico, you're going to find thousands and thousands of results. That's 100% a keyword that you should use in the back end. This will depend in every single case. Like, mm. I don't want to, uh, the, there is not a rule of thumb for that, especially if you're trying to rank for keywords in English and your space in the back end is very limited to, to you know, to, mm -hmm. to give away one in English to put one in Spanish that may be painful for a lot of sellers so maybe keeping it in three mm -hmm. at, at the beginning right but then when you're ranking really well to other things okay you can do it you can do four you can do five um I mean it's just it it really depends mm -hmm. right I, I don't I don't want to make a statement there where where it's like oh no you need to have seven keywords mm -hmm. in Spanish um that's not how it works yeah, from our using feet. probably the top three to five would be ideal and doing a little bit of research guys while you're listening to this I really want you to remember that this is faster and easier than reinventing the wheel and trying to continue to bring more products you can absolutely up your sales by doing 15 minutes of work per listing you check this um like mercado libre is i think what you called it we'll put the link in the chat so that you guys know or link in the video notes so that you guys know exactly where to get to that to kind of test the keywords but really this shouldn't take too much time to just update this listing number one opening a case for your listing so that you can make sure Sure that they update the translation um, taking a screenshot of your listing highlighting where you see the gaps the discrepancies um, say you know you have 250 characters and your Spanish translation only has some so that's step number one is updating that step number two then she said is doing some research on the multiple different uh, words and vernacular that you're using for different types of Spanish so um, like the griddle example was absolutely perfect because we know even here in in English speaking that we call things different things you know one one in one region of the country it something is called a robe in another region it's called a house coat in another region it's called um i don't know a I don't know what all these different translations are even still in our own language. So it, the same rules apply for Hispanic spe uh, Spanish speaking um natives from all of different countries. So making sure that you're aware of that and that's something that you add to that. I would say three to five back end keywords because it's just adding another demographic. There, our Spanish speaking friends are still looking for product. And if we don't have the right keywords and the right translation, they're just gonna buy from someone else. So this is easy work that you can do on your own listings that already exist. Spend 15 minutes per listing. Now, I know you guys as my students, you're already checking your listing 
listings weekly or at least monthly, right? I mean, right? You're checking your listings. You were taught well. So this is just another thing to add to your plate. Yes, but it can be one and done. You go through your listings. You do 15 minutes of research to make sure you're getting the right keywords in the right places. You update your listing, make sure Amazon updates your listing, and then you can move on. And then you just add it to the box that you check of checking your listings and making sure. And this is also a task that you can delegate to a VA if you have one. Something that you can say, here's the new process for this. We're going to go A, B, C, check these things, do this thing, and move on. So this is another thing that you can just automatically up your sales without buying inventory. This is a zero cost upgrade to your sales. That's what this is. We're just yeah. opening ourselves up to do that. And guess what? If it works for Spanish, could you imagine if you added another language there? There's other keywords in other places. You know, the US is what they say, a melting pot. A lot of people come from different countries and they come here and they still want the products that they have in their homeland and they wanna know how to search for them. And if they don't know the English word, they're gonna use the word in their native language. This can be done with every language. So if you have a specific product or product niche that you sell to a specific demographic, use the language for that demographic. It's not wasted keywords. Actually, less can be more in these specific situations. When you're already ranking in the U.S., you can be ranking in the U.S. with other languages. So it's just a free update for your listing to get you some more sales. Yeah, and two things, two more things. So so I, I can make it super overwhelming for everybody. <laughs> it's that the PPC campaigns, the, the Spanish keywords in PPC are like, a hundred thousand times cheaper than the ones in English. So that's one thing to keep in mind. There is a blue ocean out there of advertising where you could be ranking for that. And because it's cheaper and the search volume is not super massive, you won't be spending a lot if in that um, budget, but you will be ranking higher. And that, orga that, that, that uh, sponsor placement will also help you with your organic if you convert. So it's like a, a thing that you you feed the the algorithm for that and the last thing which is probably my favorite part of the hispanic market is that they are different holidays in the in different countries the holidays are different for example mother's day we have it here in in america and in some countries in latin america where it's in may i think it's the second sunday of may but other countries in, in latin america spanish speaking have it in september Mm. And other ones have it in August. So imagine what you could do, Christine, if you will have four different Mother's Day in a year. Right? Oh, so oh, if you want to know into that, that is super hot fire, you know, golden nugget right there. I love that more than anything else because you've just taken something seasonal and made it more evergreen. And I absolutely love I'm like literally that's the first thing I'm doing. I'm gonna go into my listings and put the Spanish words in there for the holiday stuff that I have. That is so groundbreaking. Yeah. Exactly, because you could do also uh, coupons, special coupons during those days, and you can have a special promotions, you know, for, for that thing. Even, even that's another thing that the advertising console lets you do. When you do a, a sponsor brand or sponsor placement, you could have the copy and you can have the images completely in Spanish if you want. Mm -hmm. right you, and that's amazing so if you want to know the all of the hispanic holidays or the major hispanic holidays go to online seller solutions.com slash hispanic hyphen holidays so we're gonna leave the link here also in the in the notes but that's a spreadsheet that i put together and you literally have every single holiday per country and the date. So let's say I'm here, I'm here, for example, Valentine's Day, interesting, Valentine's Day in Bolivia is the 21st of September. Mm. So so what if in Bolivia, oh, sorry, what if in, in the September 21st, you will go there and you will create a coupon? Mm -hmm. Just create a coupon that day because, well, not that day, maybe the day prior to that, right? Because they want to celebrate and they, and they buy that in advance. But having that in your, in your mind will make you better at, oh, let me prepare for those and let me create coupons and let me create sponsors. Even if you're gonna, if you wanna take it the extra step, super, super advanced part, it's like if you are doing 
uh, outside um, traffic, if you're bringing traffic from Google, from Facebook, from Instagram, every, any any source, then you could use that those graphics. For example, you're doing a promotion on on um, Instagram yeah. that is only gonna be for the Hispanic demographic, and you're gonna take them to Amazon, and on Amazon they will see a coupon that is gonna be only special for that time. Mm. So that's what I'm saying, and I love how you phrase it: make it your seasonal product more evergreen, having all of those holidays. So you know we have Valentine's Day is February 14, and they have in September. So mm. huge thing, it's huge. That makes such a difference uh, for everyone who sells, <clears throat> excuse me, for everyone who sells some seasonal items, you're not your major, you know, <clears throat> Christmas or Halloween or whatever for the US. But thinking about that, I had no idea that Mother's Day and or some of these other holidays are moved around in different countries. And I think that's fascinating and fantastic. You ever wonder sometimes where you have a Valentine's Day item that randomly sells at a different time, then maybe that's why. So I love the fact that now we can add these Spanish words and dare I say other words. I just met an amazing person um, in my Goldman Sachs uh, cohort who also so she was born and raised in Germany and also speaks full German and it, he, she speaks like six languages, I think. But even still there, um, these are words that we can use within our own listings that are already existing. So this does not take much more than 15 minutes of work, probably per listing, so that you can just update these things and be available. Marking your calendars. You guys know I'm all about planning ahead. And if you're going to plan ahead for Valentine's Day US, you might as well plan ahead for Valentine's day other countries add a few keywords and a couple of um promotions to around those days and i i'm absolutely going to jump into the hispanic market um we've actually already have some suppliers that we're working with and i love the fact here that now we can build we're building some bundles specifically for the hispanic uh, speaking community and using a lot of these keywords and i love that the ppc is going to be a lot less if we need to utilize that as well but honestly um you, I bet just adding some of these keywords are already going to up your organic traffic because so many other people are not using the keywords that, that Vanessa is talking about today. So thank you so much for coming and sharing a wealth of information here. I know that everybody is going to start, right? You guys are going to start immediately implementing these things. Um, where can people come to find out more about online seller solutions and hear more from you? Sure. So we have our website, onlinesellersolutions.com. We're all actually making it. Um, we're redoing the website and we're going to have a nice free resources uh, page where you're going to find SOPs, where you're going to find information, things like this that, that I show you with the calendar for the Hispanic holidays, all of the things. Um, then um, social media, I I love right now LinkedIn. That's probably my favorite social media. You can find me at Vanessa Hung. Um, on Instagram is at it's Vanessa Hong. That's where I share the most amount of information. It's like super cool because we do cool graphics. We do videos. And also we have an Instagram for the agencies, online seller solutions. And basically that's the way you ca can contact us on social. If you want to write a message and if you have any questions regarding the Hispanic market or anything related to the back end, uh, you can email me to Vanessa at online seller solutions.com. And yeah, that's basically how you can contact us. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time and your, for your expertise. I don't take that for granted. I know you could be anywhere else doing any other thing. And so we appreciate you being on the Amazon files. You guys go reach out to Vanessa. She's everywhere on uh, social and online seller solutions.com. They have solutions there for you. If you don't want to manage all of your back end and you're ready to hire that out, Vanessa and her team will take really, really good care of you there. And if not, you'll just find a lot of free resources. This was an amazing time you guys put this into practice other people aren't talking about this stuff and that's where we get an edge on the competition anybody can sell on amazon these days but can they sell with excellence only when they listen to the amazon files right <laughs> so thank you guys uh so much thank you vanessa for coming and being part of the show we appreciate you guys see you same time same place next week on the amazon files